Okay. Habakkuk chapter 2. Do you got it? Okay. We're going to begin reading in verse 2. And many of us know this scripture, but it reads this way. It says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. Look at this. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. In other words, the vision is going to come to pass. He says, though it tarry, wait for it. Say that with me. Say, wait for it. Say, pray for it. Say, fight for it. Say, do all you can. It says, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Praise the Lord. So today I want to continue in our series, Traits of the Greats. And I want to talk to you on a very important subject. That's the subject of vision. The subject of vision. Before you see it, give your neighbor a high five and you may be seated today. Vision, vision, vision. I love to talk about vision because it's so important. And throughout this series, I've been, we've been talking and, and, and I've been teaching you that next to knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're learning that along with that, there are some important traits that every Christian, every leader needs in their life to experience good success. The Bible calls us not to be mediocre, but to be uh, goodly successful in every area. How many can say amen? And there are traits that go along with that. We believe that these traits help us to enter into the promises of God and to also walk in his will. And I think that's so important that when you come to church, you want to be instructed in how to walk in God's will. How many, how many are with me on that? We want to walk in God's will. Now, I've got a question under the subject of vision for you this morning. Could it be that it is God's will for you and I to make a powerful impact while we are here on the earth? Could it be that the Lord saved us with a purpose? Could it be that Jesus paid a heavy price on Calvary so that our life could make a difference? See, we are here only for a short time. I know that we have young people in our church, a lot of young adults in our church and young families in our church. And sometimes when you're young, you feel invincible. But I want you to understand. I want you to know that we are really only here for a short time. And even in that time frame of what we have, there is only a window of opportunity to really make a difference. So we've got to do what the Bible teaches us, teach us the brevity of our days to understand that every day is valuable. To understand that the Bible says in the book of Ephesians to redeem the time, not waste the time. We, we've got to redeem the time because we've only begin, been given a short time while we are here. Somebody say amen. amen. See, many wander, many waste time in their life when they wander away from God's intentional plan for their life. They waste time. They waste days. They waste weeks. They waste seasons in their life when they begin to wander away from the plan that God saved them with. See, I've been in church 25 years and I've seen how many start well, but in the end, they don't finish really the way they intended to finish. And I believe with all my heart that if you want to be everything God has called you to be and to walk in his will, you must be clear about the vision that he has called you to. Earlier in this series, we, we've been talking about different traits. I talked to you about wisdom. We learned that wisdom is the principal matter. But I want you to know also that vision is vital. Vision is vital. And vision is vital because it establishes direction. And not only direction, but passion in a believer's life. See, when we speak of people, watch this. We're not just talking about individuals. Now, here's what happens when when vision leaks out of a person's life, an individual, a person could become dry and powerless. Their life becomes limp. Talk to me, somebody. They, they lose the cutting edge. A, a person who gets away from God's plan can become dry and powerless when they live their life without vision. But when the Bible says the people perish, it's not talking about just individuals. It's talking about groups of people. The people perish where there is no vision. Groups of people can perish where there is no vision. Let me put it this way. A nation can perish when it gets away from the original vision. 
That's why Tuesday it's so important to vote. That's what this country is fighting for. They're fighting for the vision that God intended for this country. And that's why it's important for every person to understand that God has a perfect plan and a perfect design for your life. Somebody back up your preacher this morning. See, where there's no vision, the nation can perish. Where there's no vision, the community can, can perish. Where there's no vision, the family can perish. So vision is vital. Vision is important. We need people who are going to pursue God's vision in their life. Now, when we read about the Old Testament prophets like we did in Habakkuk chapter two, we find that before God can change the future of a nation, he must first change the direction of a chosen leader. That before God can change a nation, a family, a community, a company, a church, anybody, he must change the direction of a leader. I believe it's important that every person in this place this morning begin to take an evaluation of the direction you're moving in. The direction you're moving in, because before God can change what's around you, how many know we're learning that God must first change what's inside of us? See, God will always choose a man for change. God will always choose a woman for change. Before he can change the nation, he chooses somebody who will respond to the vision of change within their life. See, God wants to bring change. I'll put it this way. God desires to release positive change. And there can be positive change wherever we go. So when God wants to bring change, he does four things. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, he chooses a person. When God sets out to bring change, he chooses a person. He takes someone and he saves their life from destruction. Am I in the right place this morning? Anyone here been saved from destruction? You know what God does? He takes people and he pulls them out of the pit. And when he sees someone in a pit, he doesn't look for the person who knows everything. The Bible says he looks for the foolish thing. Ah, oh, come on, somebody. He looks for the so-called fool, the one that's been counted out, the one that's been put down, the one that's been marginalized. The person they said nothing good could come out of that person says, you know what? That's the person I want, because when I raise them up, that's the person that's going to give me all the glory and all the honor. And I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to go ahead and give him a little bit of praise for choosing you and I when nobody else chose us. See, God first chooses a man, chooses a woman. Secondly, he takes that person and he gives them a revelation of his will. He chooses us and then he gives us a revelation of his will. See, what is vision? Often vision is the response to some great need in the world. He chooses us and he, he says, I'm going to reveal my will to you. And what I want to reveal to you is that there's a great need out there. I want you to see that there's a need. And, and, and God's will is revealed sometimes, not in the good times, but many times God's will is revealed in the struggle. Come on, somebody. If you're in a struggle this morning, if you're in a battle this morning, if you're in a slump this morning, you are a perfect candidate for God's will to be revealed within your life. Come on, somebody. Great vision often springs out of a great need. Great vision is the solution to a great problem. He raised up his church so that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Because God says there's a great problem. People are dying and going to hell. But I've got a plan. I'm going to raise up a church with power. I'm going to raise up a church with purpose. Think about our ministry. Think about the ministry of Victory Outreach. Wasn't, didn't God raise us up because there was a great problem in the earth? A great need for people to be delivered and set free. For people's dignity to be restored. Well, guess what? Was God faithful? Did God do it? Well, guess what God's doing now? He gave us back our dignity. Now he's raised us up to help others find their dignity. We're bringing dignity back to a hurting world. We're bringing dignity back to a hurting community. Come on, somebody. We're doing what God has called us to do. So he gives us a revelation of his will. But then thirdly, what he does, we find is that he chooses the person. He gives them a revelation of his will. And then thirdly, his will reanimates their life. The will of God, the vision of God will reanimate you. 
It takes something that's dead and brings it back to life. And I look out sometimes in the church and I see some people that are here, but you're not living. You're here and you're in church and you might even be faithful every week, but there's not really any life flowing out of you. And the reason why is because you've wandered away from the vision that brought you back to life. And what God's will will do, what the revelation of God will do, what the Rima word will do, what the promise will do is it will bring you back to life. Oh, come on, somebody. It will bring you back to life. The word animate, watch this. The word animate means to bring back to life or to create movement in something. It's like a cartoon, a still, a still picture is just a drawing, but it, when it's animated, the picture begins to move. The picture begins to move. Man, I don't sleep on me this morning. Open up your eyes. Don't come to church and sleep on me when the word of God is being preached. Open up your eyes. Because the one that's sleeping needs this word this morning because God wants to bring you back to life. bring you back to life the will of God will reanimate you see emotion creates positive motion maybe you need some emotion maybe you need to cry maybe you need to be broken maybe you need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired uh, you, maybe you need to be tired of losing and get so angry about it that now you say, God, I try to do it my own way, but now I want to do it your way. I don't want my will. I want your will. Come on and help your preacher this morning. The will of God will wake you up. The will of God will bring what's dead back to life. And then what's the fourth thing? This is powerful stuff. He chooses a person. He gives them a revelation of his will. His will reanimates their life. And then fourthly, God makes their life contagious. <laughs> That's the point of it all. He didn't save us to be quiet. He didn't save us to keep us in a cave. He didn't save us to be like an ostrich and bury our head in the sand and act like nobody sees us. We see you, man. We see you. We see you. We see the decisions. We see what's happening in your life. He saved you. He, he gave you his will. He revealed his plan. His plan animated you. Why? Because he wants to take your life to be a contagious life, to be an inspirational life, to be a life that makes a difference, to be a life that will help someone else break through. He commands us. He commanded Adam to be fruitful and multiply. He commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. He says, take this fire I've given you and spread it. See, there's nothing more powerful, friends, than a person with a vision. There's nothing more powerful in the earth. There's no machine. There's no system that can compare to a person that has received a full revelation of God's will in their life. There's nothing more powerful than a person who has a vision, who understands that that vision can make a positive effect. Now, sometimes we feel small. We feel like we can't make a difference. In 1871, the city of Chicago experienced the most devastating fire in the nation's history. It's called the Great Chicago Fire. One third of the city was devastated. 300 people were killed. 17,450 buildings were destroyed. That's a lot of buildings. And 100,000 people were homeless. And when they investigated the cause of the fire, they found that this great fire that burned most of the city started out very small. In fact, it started in the outskirts of the city in a barn owned by a lady named Catherine O'Leary. Catherine O'Leary had a cow. <laughs> and one night, that cow kicked over a lit lantern. And the lantern caught the hay on fire. And the hay caught the barn on fire. Then the barn caught the town on fire, 
and then it went from town to town to section to section of the city until it devastated everything and became the largest fire in our country's history. Let me say something to you. God has a cow. <laughs> God's got a cow. He said, I'm not no cow. Okay, well, whatever you are. And, and God has a vessel that he wants to use to spread a fire. And sometimes we feel like we can't do much. I see it every week. I come to church. I see some of you coming to church and you're hearing the word. And you feel like you can't do much. But let me tell you something, my friend. It doesn't take much to start a big fire. It only takes a spark. It only takes a spark. I mean, imagine if you could just get a few of you sparked up in the will of God. A few of you sparked up in the spirit of revival. What would happen if just a few of you came tonight and begin to pray and bombard the throne room of heaven? I came to tell you, man, you may not feel like much, but God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And yes, it's true. We are not much at times, but great things happen through people that have a vision. And what am I presenting to you this morning? That if you want to be great for God, if you want to be impactful for God, if you want to make a difference for God, just start somewhere. Just start coming to church every Sunday. Just start coming on Sunday night. Just start praying for 15 minutes in the morning. Come on, you don't need a lot to start a big fire. You just need a spark. I wonder if there's anyone this morning that says, I'm ready to get sparked by the Holy Ghost. Woo! Change begins with a spark. Change begins with a small spark in something that's dead, in something that's struggling. And in something that is stuck. Can I hear an amen? So what does vision do for every person? What does vision do for us? I just have two points today. Are you guys getting some so far? Write this down. Number one, vision produces power and a sense of meaning in a person's life. Vision produces power and a sense of meaning in a person's life. Paul, the apostle said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Y'all know that scripture. Paul's life had tremendous amounts of meaning and purpose, and he finished stronger than he started. I want to share this with you is that a vision of tomorrow gives us power for today. Some of you need to hear that this morning because you wake up, you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, morning and, and think like, what, what, am, what, 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 what am I going to do? Why am I even waking up? Can I just sleep another hour? But I'll tell you, a vision for tomorrow gives you power for today. Let me put it this way. A vision of heaven gives you power here on earth. And what would happen if every single person in this place begin to ask God for a renewed vision? A renewed vision within their life. See, often a heavenly vision has to do with a heavenly task. Sometimes we want to try to spiritualized vision. Well, let me tell you how the Bible talks about vision. The Bible refers to vision as task. Somebody say task. It refers to vision as task. You see, when God created Adam, he did two things. He placed him in his presence and he gave him a job. That'll speak to a man. I know the women got it all together, so I'm not preaching the women tonight because... You know, women are perfect and whatnot. <laughs> but you know what God did, brothers? He, he, he created man. He put him in the garden where his presence was constantly. And then he gave him a job. He gave him a task. You see, every major example in scripture possessed a task from God. When you talk about vision, how does it, how does it relate and boil down? It, it boils down to a task. Someone say a task. Someone say a job to do. Every, every example in scripture had a task from God. Abraham's vision was to create a nation by faith. Moses' vision was to lead the people out of bondage in Egypt. Joshua's vision was to lead the people into the promised land. 
Solomon's vision was to complete the temple that David had a desire to build. Nehemiah's vision was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Esther's vision was to save the people from Haman's plot. Jesus' vision was to seek and save the lost. And Paul's vision was to take the gospel to the world and build the church. So here's the million dollar question. What's your vision? What's your task? What do you wake up in the morning? Oh, come on. I'm preaching good right now. What wakes you up in the morning, man? What gets you up when in the morning? You say, oh, man. Some, some, some of you say, wake up and say, good morning, Lord. Some of you wake up and say, good Lord morning. I'm trying to change your vocabulary this morning and understand that God has a vision for your life. God's got a task for your life. Listen, I came to tell you, you're not called to survive. You're not called just to make it and waste your days. He has created you with a purpose and a destiny. Now, now let me ask you this. Some of you that you say, well, I'm not clapping because I've got a vision. Here's a question. Is your vision big enough to give your life the meaning and satisfaction to cause for you to stay on fire for God? Let me tell you something, man. Anything you can do in your own ability will eventually kill you spiritually. Whatever you can do in your own power will not have the ability to take you to the next dimension and take you into the future. You know what my pastor says about vision? He says God's vision is a God sized task. To have a real heavenly vision is not to have a vision of what we can do, but to have a vision of only what God can do. You've got to begin to recognize you need a vision that's going to keep you praying. You need a vision that's going to keep you serving. You need a vision that's going to keep you alive in the house of the Lord and not dead like a dead tree in a forest. Come on, somebody. You need a bigger vision. You need to begin to up. Grade your vision. Someone said there's nothing more tragic than for a person to wake up and realize they fulfilled a vision that was too small. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? I've done it all. I put all my kids off to college. I, I, I paid all my bills. I'm debt free. And now I'm, I got this hobby here and that hobby there. And I'm over here doing this and I'm over here doing that. Meanwhile, something in you is dying. Something in you is going to sleep. Something in you, you used to be on fire. You used to pray. You used to seek God because you dreamed, you dreamed big. What happened to the dream? What happened to the vision? What happened to God's who, man? Not, not getting a lot of claps because it hits the heart sometimes. You're made for more. You're made for more. Let me tell you something. You're not made just to make money. You're not made just to clock in to the same job for 35 years. You're not made just to carry a lunchbox to work every day and go to sleep at 7 o'clock every night and wake up at 6 a.m. like a robot. You need to understand God has created you and saved you with a purpose. He wants your life to be an inspiration. I'm preaching good this morning. Some of you may not like it, but you're not called to be a boring, dead Christian in the house of the living God. He's called you to be an inspiration. What am I saying, my brothers, my sisters? He has given you a testimony. I can't think of a greater testimony than some of our men and women that graduated from our recovery homes. So I got any men's and women's homes graduates in the house this morning. Man, what did God do? Some of them graduated the home on fire for God, filled with the vision, filled with the principles and values of this ministry. They learned faithfulness, loyalty, commitment. And then they tried to get jobs and they couldn't get jobs. No one would hire them. They said, this is what Jesus did. Well, we need someone with some schooling. We need someone with some, with some trade. We need some people with this. So our people, you know, God, nothing's impossible for God. The God that could pull them out of prison and expunge their record. Come on, somebody. The God that could pull a needle out of their arm. See, sometimes we forget the God that took the pipe out of their mouth. The God that healed their marriage. The God that saved their kids. The God that did the miracle. The God that healed their body. They said, fine, you're not going to hire me. I'll start my own business. 
And if God save me and God deliver me, why can't God bless me? Why can't God bless my business? And you know what I love about those ones? They, they do their business, but they stay grateful. That's what makes Victory Outreach what it is. We don't have the most skilled people, the most talented people, the best looking people. But we have the most grateful people. We have the most grateful people. We have the, most, the people that know how to give God glory for their blessing. We have the people that when, when other churches won't give God glory and walk in pride and walk in a spirit of entitlement, there's a church, a ministry called Victory Outreach that knows how to give God praise for what he's done. They know how to raise their children to give God praise for what they... Come on, somebody. I'm preaching the gospel to you this morning. Where is the grateful church? Where are the people that still give God praise for what he has done? Where are the people with a vision that's bigger than self? Woo! I think some of us need to upgrade that vision. That if God has been faithful to you financially, now's the time for you to say, Lord, what's my next mission? What have you called me to do? Because if you don't answer that call, you could die spiritually. You could waste days. Your life will become limp in the house of the Lord. My God. What's the last thing here? I only have two points this morning. Did you get something today? Vision produces power and a sense of meaning. But secondly and lastly, vision inspires others to greatness. Vision, a man or a woman with a vision, is an inspiration to hopeless and dying people. A man or a woman that knows that God pulled them out of the pit and save them, and raise them, and train them, and is shaping them, that life becomes an inspiration. That life, see, see we got to get out of this thing of just being a Christian that comes to church. Some of you need to get out of that. <laughs> well, I'm here. I know, but you look so sad. You, you look so sad being here because you're here, but you don't have a vision to why you're here. And what I'm trying to present to you this morning is that it's not just coming to church. It's having a vision and understanding that what God did in your life inspires others to do great things. Begin to search your heart and say, what did God do for me? What did God do in my life? Understand that what flows out of that testimony, it's what's going to inspire other people. I want to live a life that's an inspiration. I want to live for God. Watch this. But I also want to live for people. I want to live for God. But I want to live for people. When people look at my life, I want them to see somebody that even though my life has faced struggle and battle, <laughs> I'm still pressing in like never before. I feel responsible for people. Not in a sense of being able to solve all their problems, but in a sense of being able to walk in a way that could be an example to them. If you're a leader in this church, I hope and pray that you have the same heart. To understand that they're watching everything you say, they're watching everything you do, they're watching everything about you, and you can lead them to victory or you can lead them to destruction. Oh my God. Our life is supposed to be an inspiration to hurting people, our marriage is supposed to be an inspiration to other marriages. Young people are called. To be an inspiration. Do you know what the, the definition and the dividing line of that is? It's something called passion. Everybody just say passion. passion. That's what makes our life attractive. Passion. Being passionate. Walking in passion. Preaching with passion. 
Singing with passion. Serving with passion. Living life with passion. Passion. That's the difference. Someone said passion is the fuel that propels men and women towards anything significant and achievable. Passionate people are the source of any real change in the world. If, if you look at change in the world, it will always track back to someone who is passionate. Leaders and innovators in any industry share one common trait. Watch this. They simply love what they do. They simply love what they do. Man, when you love what you do, it's an inspiration. When you love God's plan for your life and you love that giant vision God has given you, it creates inspiration. But it also creates reward in you. When you love what you do, you're going to be financially rewarded and you're going to be personally rewarded. And even when you're not financially rewarded, guess what? You'll still receive personal reward because you love what you do. And not only that, but you impact others simultaneously. That's when your life moves from merely having success to having significance. You see, every person will be remembered in this life for their passion or their lack of it. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be viewed? What do you want them to say when they look at your life? I, I'll tell you, when they look at me, I don't want them to ever accuse me of preaching boring sermons. You see? I don't want them ever to accuse me of not loving my wife the way she needs to be loved and serving my family and taking care of my family the way and, and loving my church and, and coming to this church every week. I'm here every day. Coming with a bad attitude. And coming here and grudging. Oh, my God. I'm called to be passionate. I'm called to bring change wherever I go. I'm, I'm called. That's my job. And there's so many people. And I'm going to bring it home. But you, I'm done preaching. You guys get something today? That they wait for others to do it for them. And that's why nothing ever gets done, because you cannot delegate your passion to somebody else. Right. Let me give you a great example. How many have seen that wall across the street? It's a little wall. Let me tell you something about that wall. It was bugging me. Did it bug you at all? But you didn't do nothing about it. <laughs> Bugging me. No one ever talked to each other about it. No conversations, no meetings. Never walked in and said to somebody, does that wall bug you? Does that wall bug you? No, no, nothing was ever said. But every time I stop at that left turn, it began to bug me. Started out with, Man, the city should really do something about that wall. <laughs> then it became, who owns that property? Miller? Oh, well, yeah. Man, Miller, that guy should really do something about that wall. People don't care. They don't care. There's so many people in this community just trying to take something out of it, but not willing to put something into it. And I, and I was there about a couple years ago, and I'm sitting there saying, oh, they hit it again. And then I said one day, well, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, I want you to do something about it. And I said, but that's not my wall. And the Holy Spirit says, but you love what you do, right? And you're passionate, right? 
and you have a big vision, right? And Victor Arch is supposed to change not only the world, but the community, right? And I said, okay, Lord, I get it. So I started inquiring about the wall. Who owns a wall? What do we need to do? Get permission. Miller called. We can do this. The guy says, I don't want this. I don't want that. Blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, let's get going. Let's do it. We're in the middle of doing the children's department. You know, we couldn't get those artists, so I just had to wait. Finally, I found an artist in L.A. I said, how much are you going to, can you come on out and do this thing? Hey, would you be willing to give? Would you be willing to just use your skills, man, for Jesus, bro? And he's a Christian. <laughs> He says, oh, man, I love God, brother. He says, but it's going to cost you 10 grand. Make sure the check is in my name. I said, nah, that's cool. <laughs> no, it wasn't, that, it wasn't even that. He turned me off. Then he was calling me and calling me and calling me and calling me. I went to L.A. preaching one of the churches. He went all the way to meet me. He said, this is what I got. I said, I'm tired of working with takers. I'm tired of working with people that are going to serve and leave me, at a, leave me a bill. I won't do it. I won't do it. So I waited, and I said, I'm going to do God as I'm going to pay for it myself. How much is it going to be? I think do it for $6,000. I'm going to go to the people, see if they want to give. But then we were raising money. I go, I think I want to give that wall. So I'll find the money. I'll find the money. I'll find the money. I know I'll go find six grand somewhere. Maybe it's under one of the chairs in the church. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, right when I said that in my heart and I was ready to cut the check, I get a phone call from the mayor's office. How many know God sees everything? And they say, hey, uh, are you Pastor Al? I say, yes. I'd like to see if we can meet with you because um, the mayor's fund. Let's just say it got my attention. <laughs> would like to do an outreach, and they want Victor Arch to be the centerpiece of that, com of that outreach. And uh, I had known in our heart that for 10 years we've been giving out turkeys, toys, blankets, coats, meals. Places to sleep and longer than that. Can I hear an amen? So when I got that call and they said they wanted to bless us, I was ready to receive the blessing. <laughs> Bring it on in. We don't beg. We just do what we got to do. Because how many when good people step up, other good people want to get involved? So I said, I'm not a taker. I'm a giver, man. I mean, if it were up to me, I'd paint every building in this neighborhood. So we get into the meeting, and the lady's pitching, and she's saying, you know, we're going to do this. I want to give out these turkeys, and we're going to have all these businesses, and blah, blah, blah. And anybody have any ideas? And there was about six, seven of us from the community there. The police captain, who we've developed a great relationship with, all these people had ideas. And said, what about you, Pastor? Do you have an idea? I said, I do. You see that wall across the street? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we did an artistic piece and we had the council person come and dedicate? I'm sure they'd get a lot of votes. <laughs> she says, they would. And she says, but what happened was when I began to present it, you should see what happened to her face. I mean, she was talking about the turkeys, and then all of a sudden I said about the wall, she went, She lit up like a light bulb. She said, that's exciting. Wow. Do you have people that could do it? And you know, when you got a vision, you, you may not have it, but you'll find it. <laughs> so I just said, yes, I do. I have all kinds of people willing to give, willing to sow, willing to move in a big vision. I got them. They're here somewhere. So I said, so her name's Dina. I said, Dina, how much will it cost me? She goes, what do you mean? 
I go, well, I'm I got a check. I'm ready to get it done. I just want to see if the mayor will, or the councilwoman will dedicate it. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to pay for it. Come on, somebody. We're going to pay for it. And I said, okay. I feel that's the Lord. I go, well, let's get the councilwoman to dedicate it. He goes, no, I'll do one better. Let's get the mayor. Let's get Kevin Falker. She says, let's get KUSI. Let's get Univision. Let's put it on the TV. Come on, somebody. See what happens? And so then she called me. We had been meeting, meeting, meeting for months. And finally, just the other day, she called me. She goes, you know, Pastor Allen, the artist submitted the budget. She said, ooh, it's expensive. I said, it is. It's expensive. I said, yeah. She goes, my budget won't cover everything. I said, you know what, Dina, don't worry about it. Just what can you cover? She told me. I said, Victory Outreach San Diego will pay the rest because we have a vision. <laughs> have a vision. And how many know that's the key as I get ready to close here is you got to have love. Someone say love. love. I love what I do. I love what I do. Do you love it? Leaders, do you still love it? Pastors, do you still love it? Victor Alex San Diego, do you still love it? I love it. The power of love. The growing and thriving ministries are led by leaders who love what they do, who are constantly cultivating their heart. Also, love inspires. It sends the right message about the vision. It says to everybody, this vision God's given us, this is an exciting vision. This is not a burdensome vision. I see people, you know, they carry it. Like, it, it, it's so hard, you know. One, one person once said, it's not what you carry, it's how you carry it. Oh, it's so hard to serve Jesus. Just get, get away from me, man. Jeez. I love serving Jesus. I love serving God. I love what Jesus has done in my life. Do you love it? And then love makes an impact because you know what love does is what I shared. Love gives. When you have a vision, you're going to pour everything you have into that vision. When you have a vision from God and you wake up in the morning, you love your vision. Say, I want to give everything I have to that vision. I want to just give my time and give my talent and give my treasure and give everything I have. I want to give all my prayer, all my energy to see that vision come to pass. You love the vision. You just, you don't want to give some. You want to give everything. We were out there at the wall just this week. We're out there all excited because when you love something, you're there. I could have been doing a million things on Saturday. I'm sitting out there in a chair, and we have 50, 60, 70 people walking by the wall saying, I'm so grateful you're doing this. I'm so grateful this is happening. And so when people love, love it and they love what you do, you don't pull back. You get more involved. So then Johnny Duran comes out. He goes, you know what we should do, Pastor? Because there's all kinds of dirt out here. You know, this thing's going to be beautiful. I go, what are you thinking, Johnny? What we're going to do, we're going to clean up this whole thing. We're going to get some, some grass. You want to put grass? I go, let's get some lights. Yeah, let's get some lights. We're going to put lights. I put five lights. He goes, no, 14 lights, 14 lights. <laughs> so when the people drive by, we could light it at night, and they could see that this is a beautiful community. This is a beautiful place where God is doing big things. See, and I said, well, who's going to pay for it? He goes, I'll get donations. I go, no, I'll pay for it. He goes, I'll get donations. I'll pay for it. It doesn't matter. We just love what we do. We want it to be great for God. So if you're a leader out there today, as I close, and you're not getting the results, ask yourself a couple of things. Number one, is your vision big enough? Maybe you're getting tired because you're doing your vision and your strength. But then secondly, is your vision, is your life inspiring? Do you have joy? Are you excited? 
And then lastly, are you working in love and just loving your vision in a way where you're not giving something, you're giving everything, everything to that vision. It's heavy, huh? Some of you are looking at me like, Pastor, that, that's heavy, man. I, I feel something inside of my heart right now that I haven't felt in a mighty long time. And, and, I, and you're saying, you know what? Yeah, you know what, Pastor? That's right. If I'm going to get a breakthrough, if I'm going to see this vision come to pass, if I'm going to really see my family be everything, and I'm going to do all these things, then you know what, Pastor? I, I, I got to love it. I can't be grumpy. I can't be sad. I can't be defeated. I've got to give everything in a spirit of love and watch how God is going to begin to bless that thing. I believe that that's what's going to move you into greatness in your life and in your ministry. Would you stand with me today? Let's give God a praise. Can we just clap for the Lord? I'm you know, that's what we need. As I think about where we're headed as a movement internationally there's a lot of change going on I don't know if you know that a lot of change with our young people a lot of change with our recovery homes our homes are, are going through a lot of changes right now and if we didn't have love for the home or love for the gang we'd be fighting it man, why are they changing? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Why, why, it was good the way it was. That's why good neighborhoods turn into ghettos. That's why California schools are 48th in the country. That's why ministries don't grow. They actually die because they're unwilling to change. And let me tell you, what, what doesn't change eventually dies. So we're having all these changes with the home and the youth, and we're saying, you know what? It's going to hurt, but let's do it. <laughs> because we want to live. We want to see God do great things. And change is here. But it causes me to look at the church and look at some of you and say, man, there's some of you that you haven't changed in a long time. You need to change. You need to get back to that vision that the Lord saved you for. And I know this message not, may not be for everybody, but there's some of us here that certainly this message is for you. And the minute you, you step out of that seat and you come to this altar, you're going to feel something you haven't felt in a long time. You're going to feel that animation of God's will.